it's, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here today and have this opportunity to give you my view of computer science. And basically what my talk is, is going to be about is, is about change. Uh, it turns out that uh, the information age uh, is going to be a big part of your life and it's fundamentally changing all, all aspects of, of society. And those, those individuals, those institutions, those corporations, those nations that understand this change and position themselves are, are going to have a, a much nicer future. And what I'm going to do today in my talk is I'm going to take the first half of my talk and just give you kind of a view, kind of a show and tell of the future. And then in the second half, I, I will actually show you a little bit of the science that's going to be needed to support that future. Uh, so in the early years uh, of, of computer science, we were focused on making computers useful. So we were concerned with programming languages, compilers, operating systems, uh, databases, and things of that type. Uh, and I don't want to say that these are unimportant today, but we have reached the stage where we have made computers useful and the future of computer science is going to be in how uh, computers are used. So things that, that we're able to do is we're able to track the flow of ideas in scientific literature, uh, track uh, social communities and how they grow. Uh, for the first time, social scientists can track millions of people and see how relationships evolve. Uh, we're going to look at massive data streams, extracting signals from noise, and look at high dimensional data. And uh, the, the drivers of this change are the merging of computing and communications, and it may be that the communications is more important aspect, that data is available in digital form, and that we're networking devices and sensors. Uh, and what we have to do is we have to recognize this change and develop a new theory to support uh, these, these activities. And we also have to update computer science education. In the last 30 years, uh, discrete mathematics was a big part of computer science. But in the future, it's probably going to be probability and statistics because you're going to have data sets which are so large that you're going to have to sample them. You're not going to be able to look at the entire range of data. So I thought I'd just give you a glimpse of how things might change. You might think that Google was a tremendous advance, and, and it was, but that that's the end of it. But what you'll notice when you start doing searches now, if you type in a question like, when was Einstein born? Up at the top, there'll be a line which says, Einstein was born at Ulm in Württemberg, Germany on March 14, 1879. And how did the search engine figure that out? Well, uh, it just simply looked at a web page that had the words Albert Einstein had the word born and a date, and they, that sentence was probably the sentence that they want to display for you. So in the future, you're not going to ask for web pages and search through those web pages for the data that you want, but you're going to want the actual answer to your question. Uh, things you might want to ask is, which car should I buy? What are the key papers in theoretical computer science? Uh, construct a bibliography on graph theory. Uh, or where should I go to college? Uh, where, where should you do, get your PhD? Uh, how did the field of computer science develop? And what you would like back are reasonable answers. So let me just show you. If you ask, which car should I buy? Realize that the search engines have had this, uh, this query millions of times, and they know what search pages people looked at, and they know what words were on those pages, and they can make a list of things that might be important to you, like fuel economy, crash safety, reliability, and they ask you to rank these, these uh, properties, and then what they will do is they will produce for you a list of cars uh, suited to the criteria that you give. And uh, if you decide, well, I'm interested in the Toyota Camry, you, it'll, you could click on picture, you would get a picture, you could click on a, a report, and it will give you an article in Car and Driver or somewhere like that specifically on the model that you are, are interested in. This is the kind of response that you're going to want. If you ask what are the key uh, papers, research papers in computer science, you would like to get a list of the top 10, 20 papers. You don't have to want to go through, look at papers and wondering, is this a good paper to read? Was it influential? Or something like that. And you might ask, well, how can the search engine figure out which are the important papers? Uh, I'll just give you one glimpse as to why this could be done. 
Some researchers took uh, all of the papers that appeared in the KDD conference uh, for the past 11 years, and they're all in digital form, so they were able to cluster them. And then what they did is they plotted the size of clusters over time. And what you can see is you can see that certain areas, like the yellow and the light blue, are areas that look like they're becoming more important. And if you're looking for a PhD topic, maybe that would be an area to work in. Uh, some other area, like these lower ones here, which are coming less important, maybe you want to uh, uh, avoid those. And if you look at these areas, the ones that are growing have to do with kernel margin support vector machine, VC dimension, or Bayesian mixture posteriori likelihood. And those match my intuition as to which areas are actually growing today. Uh, if I put in a query and I put, type in coffee shop, I happen to be, when I made this slide, I happen to be in Cartagena, uh, and I, I forgot to change it. I uh, apologize on that. But I didn't want to get a coffee shop in Ithaca, New York. Uh, I wanted the search engine to know where I was and find a, a, a local coffee shop. And so this kind of information is going to be available to search engines, and it's going to raise various issues. And if you type in Michael Jordan, what do you want for an answer? Uh, most people are going to get a basketball star. But if the search engine knows that you're a computer scientist, it's going to say, well, maybe he wants the Michael Jordan, who's at Berkeley, who's a computer scientist. And uh, this is what the future is going to be like. Now, there are privacy issues that come up. Uh, one of the things, uh, medical images are, are going to be digitized. And when you go see a doctor, you would like the doctor to have complete access to your entire medical record uh, because he or she needs that in order to give you the best possible treatment. Uh, but your insurance company, uh, I'm not sure how much information you want to share with your insurance company. Uh, certainly not your entire medical record. And in fact, maybe you only want to share enough so that they know they have to pay the bill. And I'll show you in a minute that they don't even need to know uh, what doctor, uh, what the symptoms were, what the medical diagnosis was. All they need to know is have proof that they really should pay the bill. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Uh, now, a researcher needs statistical information, but no identifiable individual information. And, and the question is, is how are we going to maintain this kind of data and users and know what kind of data various users should be entitled to, to see? And to show you that there is some theory that's being developed to solve this problem, I'm going to talk a little bit about zero-knowledge proofs. Now, a zero-knowledge proof is, is simply if I want to prove something to you without giving you any information about the thing I'm proving. So, for example, I want to prove to the insurance company that they've got to pay a certain doctor a bill, but I don't want to let them know that they fixed your broken leg or something like that. How do I do it? So I'm going to pick a, a mathematical problem. I'm going to pick graph three colorability. And what this problem is, is, is you have an undirected graph. It has vertices and edges. And what I want is a coloring of the vertices with just three colors so that no two adjacent vertices are the same color. Now, let's suppose I was in a business of doing graph colorings for you. Uh, this is an NP-complete problem, so it, it's hard to do. You have a graph with a million vertices and you would like to get it colored. And for a reasonable amount of money, I'm willing to color it, but we have the following difficulty. You're not sure that I can color your graph, and you don't want to give me the money before I color your graph because you're not sure whether I'm a fraud and I'm going to walk off with the money. And I don't want to show you the coloring until I get the money uh, because I'm not sure you're going to pay me that you've got the money, okay? So how do I prove to you that I've got a coloring of your graph without giving you any information about how to do it. Okay, so here, here's what we're going to do. What I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm going to color it privately, not show it to you. And for each uh, vertex of the graph, I'm going to create an envelope. And I'm going to take a piece of paper of the color of that vertex and stick it into the envelope and seal it up. Now, I'm just telling you that way, actually what I'm really going to do, we're going to do this electronically. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to encrypt the color uh, of the vertex but, and not let you see what color it is. So I give you the envelopes. And uh, what you do is uh, I will let you open two envelopes. So you pick an edge and you ask for those two envelopes. 
you open them and make sure that they're different colors. Okay? Now, I've given you no information as to how to color the graph because you could permute the colors and always get a coloring with those two vertices that color. Okay? But you don't, you've only got, you managed to get one edge of my 100 million edges in my graph right. Uh, so you would like to say, show me another edge. But I don't want to show you another edge because then I've given you some information as to the coloring. So what I do instead is I destroy all the envelopes. I go back and I permute the colors of the vertices. So I still have a three coloring of the graph, but I've just colored the, I've interchanged blue and red and so forth. And then I say, take the envelopes and say, which two envelopes would you like to open? So you pick another two with an, uh, that, uh, vertices at ends of an edge, and you see I got that right. You say, hmm, maybe. Well, after you do this a hundred million times or a billion times, and I'm always correct, you can show that the probability that I have a coloring uh, goes, goes to one. The probability I don't have a coloring is something like one over two to the hundredth. So, so I've convinced you I have a coloring, but I haven't given you any information how to do it. I, I just wanted to show you this as an example because you may think that's, that's silly that you could prove to the insurance company that they have to pay the bill without their knowing anything about what it's for. Okay, but it's not just medical records that this problem comes up. Uh, I'll, and I'll show you a, a couple other systems. Maybe I'll, how about just we'll, we'll talk about cars and roads. Uh, when, if you have a guidance system in your car, it always tends to keep you on major roads because they don't know what the condition of some of the back roads are. But many of the local people take the back roads. Uh, for example, this is a, a road. I, I come along here to get on Interstate 81 by this path marked in red arrows. But I noticed that when I was driving that people ta often take a shortcut. They go like that, and then they take another shortcut like that. And my guidance system never gave this to me. Now, what you could imagine is your car recorded the GPS coordinates as you drive. And when you go in for service, they're downloaded. And then the guidance system could make use of all drivers in the United States and what roads they take. could figure out which are local drivers and know nice roads to take and upgrade your, your routing system. And if they could save you 1% in mileage, that would be an enormous savings in, in gas. Uh, the difficulty is, is I don't want them to have my GPS coordinates because they would figure out first who I am by where I park my car at night, where I work, who I visit, and all kinds of other things. And so what we have to do is see how we can share this information without letting the guidance system, the people who use it, have any idea who's, who's, who they're looking at. Uh, this is, we tend to track things. Uh, I'll just skip up to here. You can track anything. Uh, this is a website that has every commercial aircraft in the United States that's in the air at any given time. Uh, there are 5,000 planes at a uh, typical time. They're in the air. And it used to be when my wife was going to pick me up at the airport, she would call the airport to see if the flight was on time. And it was rare that she would get reliable information. She doesn't do that anymore. She just puts a, search into a, a query into a search engine and finds out where the plane is. This is a flight going from Newark to San Francisco, and it's just over is that Nebraska up there. So it's another two, two and a half hours before it arrives. She can have another cup of coffee before she goes to the airport. Uh, these kinds of things, we were out in Seattle, and we were going to go up to Snoqualmie Pass, and she was concerned about road conditions. Instead of calling the highway patrol, what we did is we went on the web and we found a camera which was looking at the road surface at the pass. The road was completely dry. She said, fine, let's go. Uh, later that trip, we were north of Seattle. The airport was south of Seattle. I asked, how long does it take to get to the airport? And someone said, anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours, depending on traffic. Uh, once again, what we did is we uh, found cameras along uh, I-5 and we saw that the traffic was light, and so uh, we waited a little. Uh, and you, you probably have been places where uh, you see the, the speed of cars on every road. This is the Palo Alto area. Uh, if, it's, if it's marked in green, cars are going over 55 miles an hour. 
yellow, they're, they're going over 30 miles an hour. The other roads, either there isn't enough traffic to, to measure the velocity or they're under 30 miles per hour. And what you can see is that something has happened down here uh, that's causing a congestion. And your guidance system, when it has access to this information, may reroute you depending on traffic conditions and things like that. Uh, if you go to Beijing, what you will discover is they have liquid crystal displays beside the road telling you how fast traffic is moving on adjacent roads so that you can reroute yourself without having a guidance system. Uh, I show this slide because I, I used to, I live a mile and a half from my office and I really enjoyed walking home, but I didn't like to get walk in the rain. And so what I did is I uh, would call up a radar unit which shows me where it's raining. And what I would do is I would back that unit up 30 minutes. And that was what this black arrow uh, shows. Oh, the path that I walk home is this yellow arrow. And you can see by backing it up 30 minutes how the, rain, the, the weather is moving. And you can see that's perfectly fine for me to walk home. The, I'm not going to get wet at all. But on another day, and there's my path home, it's pouring rain. What do I do? Well, I back the station up 30 minutes and saw that the weather would shift that far in 30 minutes. And lo and behold, you can see that there is a break. Uh, there's a break of about 30 or 40 minutes. And if I wait uh, 30 minutes and then start home, I'll get home and I, and I won't get wet. Now, you're not going to have to do this. You're not going to have to, you're going to have on your iPhone uh, if, if you like to walk home in the evening and uh, you just say, when should, can I go? And it's going to give you a little chart showing when it's going to rain and when it's not, uh, things of that type. Uh, this is a slide. We were interested in bird migration. And what we, the reason we were interested is a number of years ago there was a concern that the Asian flu virus was going to migrate to Europe and then to the United States. But to figure out what the probability of this happening required you to know about 6,000 species of birds and when they occupied the same area and things of this type. And the difficulty is, is that there is very little knowledge about the flight paths of these 6,000 species. And so we asked, could we uh, extract this information from the web? And we took one bird, the ruby-throated hummingbird, and we took the sightings. It turns out there's lots of sightings of birds. People do this as a hobby, and there are websites that give them. And so we took the data of sightings of websites of hummingbirds. We put a mathematical model underneath and then we adjusted the parameters to best explain the sightings. And this is reasonably sophisticated because how many birds are going to be sighted in an area depends partly not only on how many birds, but how many people there are looking at them. And, but we put a model as to how far a bird could fly in a day. And what we did is we came up uh, with these flight paths for the hummingbird. Uh, they start out in Mexico. And you'll notice that when they, in the spring, when they go up to North America, up the East Coast, half of them fly across the Gulf and half of them take a land route. They then migrate up, they come back. But interesting, when they come back, nobody flies across the Gulf. So we went out to the ornithology lab and said, is this correct? And they said, yes, to the best of our knowledge, you have the flight paths of, of the hummingbird. So this is just to give you an example of how we're going to extract information from the web in the future. And your career is going to be to develop the science base that's needed to, to do these kinds of things. And I'll talk about a few of these. I'll show you some work on tracking the flow of ideas, uh, evolution of communities, and how to extract data from unstructured sources. So tracking the flow of ideas in scientific literature. Uh, this is work uh, you, of Yu Kung Jo, who just got her PhD this year. Uh, what she did is she looked at the ACM literature. And it's all in digital form. And she classified it, she uh, clustered it into topics. And her topics are very narrow uh, topics. I'm going to be interested in this one at the bottom, 648. And this topic is... Uh, making C programs type safe by separating uh, pointer types uh, to prevent memory stops. Uh, and uh, what you will notice is what she wanted to do is go back and see which topics led to this topic. In other words, what was the flow of ideas through scientific literature over time? And what you will notice is that there are sort of three threads that led to this topic. Uh, they're in the three different colors, and 
the edges between topics show if these topics are related, that, that there are references of papers in one topic to references of papers in another. You'll notice that there are no references between these three threads. And these three threads have to do with type, garbage collection, and pointer analysis. And then they came together for the topic that she was interested in. And you can see that this kind of being able to do, create this automatically is going to help you search the scientific literature in ways that you weren't able to before. If you look at the entire ACM corpus, uh, you get a map something like this. And what you can see is you can see there's a graphics literature which doesn't seem to interact with any of the other literature. Uh, there's database, architecture, network, natural language processing. And uh, this can all be done automatically. So that's to give you an idea of, of how, you, how search of scientific literature is going to change. Uh, social networks, uh, people have started to cluster networks. And the in initial work was mathematical. Uh, what people did is they tried to partition a network into two sets of about equal size with a minimum number of edges between them. So if they had 100 million uh, articles, they'd like to break it into about two groups of 50 million uh, with a small number of cuts. And a lot of nice mathematical work was developed there. But that's not quite the problem that we're really interested in. If you're interested in communities, what you want to do is you want to find a group of about 100 vertices which are tightly clustered and maybe not too, have too many edges to the rest of the community. And furthermore, you'd like to do this in time proportional to the size of the community and independent of the size of the entire network. Okay. So the early work that was measuring the quality of communities, uh, they used a quantity called conductance. And conductance was the ratio of the number of edges going out of the community to the number of edges in the community. And a lot of the algorithms minimize conductance. And that's been well studied and pretty well understood. But our view of a community is slightly different. Uh, this blue area represents theoretical computer science. I put myself in there. And I have connections to people in theoretical computer science. But I also have many more connections outside of the community than I do inside. So this mathematical notion of conductance probably was not the right uh, criteria to be evaluating communities by. Uh, and the point is, is that I'm in many overlapping communities. And so the people who early on partitioned the network into disjoint communities, while it was important work, is probably not the right thing to do. What we want to do is see how we find overlapping communities. So there was some work done uh, uh, by Mishra, Schreiber, Stanton, and Tarjan uh, called an alpha-beta community. And in an alpha-beta community, everybody in the community is connected to at least a beta fraction of the members of the community. And, but nobody outside the community is connected to more than an alpha fraction. But their definition allowed somebody in the community to be connected to an arbitrarily large number of people outside. So this seemed to be a major step in looking at overlapping communities. So what we did is we found communities, uh, a number of communities, and we picked a, a graph, a, tw a tweeter graph, about 200,000 nodes, and we found, we found 10,000 communities and then we quit. But we noticed that these communities were highly overlapping. And in fact, then what we did is we intersected them and came up with a core. And this suggested another change in the definition of a community. Uh, up until now, people have thought of a community as something that maybe has a mathematical definition, well defined. But a community probably has a very uh, fuzzy boundary. Whether someone is in or out is probably going to depend on who you talk to. So we have to modify things that way. And kind of research, and so I'm talking about things that, that need work. Uh, different social networks are going to have different kinds of communities. You're probably going to have to develop different algorithms to, to work on them. And so the question is, is how do you classify social networks and how do you classify communities? I'm going to go through uh, just a couple of other things that are of interest. Uh, one of the things we need is a theory of sparse vectors. And a vector is sparse if, let's say, you have a thousand-dimensional vector, 
but it only has seven non-zero components. And you wonder, why, why would John be interested in sparse vectors? Uh, it turns out, uh, things are, I find things to be important if they come up in many different domains. And I'll show you how sparse vectors come up in biology. Suppose you were a plant breeder, and you have a number of plants, and you have a matrix, and each row of the matrix corresponds to one of your plants. And you have some observables in your plant, whether it's a nice flower or something like that, something that you're trying to improve the breeding of. So that's that observable. And the, the columns in this matrix correspond to positions on the genome. And you'd like to figure out which genes contribute to those, the things that you want to improve. And so you would like to solve this linear set of equations for this long uh, vertical vector here. Now, you might say, wait a minute. How can I solve uh, this set? Because there are many more columns and rows. There's going to be a high dimensional vector space of solutions. Which one do you want? It turns out that if you want a sparse solution, the solution will be unique. And you, I'll give you two reasons why you, that might be so. One of them is uh, the physics of this. It would be very unusual if there were two small sets of genes which gave rise to the same physical phenomenon. That's just not how evolution doesn't, uh, is, is very thrifty. It wouldn't evolve two different things, ways of doing the same thing. So this, this solution has got, to be, uh, uh, it's got to be a sparse solution, and that better be unique. And it's, there's going to be a little bit of random noise, so the, it's not going to be like there are just three non-zero elements. There may be some very low-valued uh, 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 elements in there. And, but then it's interesting to study mathematically what is the property of a matrix that gives rise to unique sparse solutions. Okay. So what I wanted to do in that part of the talk is just convince you that the future is going to be exciting, it's going to be interesting, but we've got to develop some theory to, to support that. Okay. And the theory is going to have to do with things like large graphs, spectral analysis, high dimensions. And let me just quickly go through and show you how this theory is developing. So for large graphs, you're going to deal with graphs with billions of vertices. Uh, when I was in a graduate student, graphs only had seven or eight vertices, and you could draw them on a piece of paper. <laughs> Furthermore, if you removed an edge or added an edge, you fundamentally changed properties of the graph. But the graphs you're dealing with, if I randomly remove 1,000 edges, it's not going to change any interesting property. And so you need a theory of graphs which is fundamentally different than the theory that, that uh, I was introduced to. And furthermore, you better be able to prove some theorems in your theory. So the start at this was due to Erdős and Rainey. Uh, they developed a, what's called the GNP model. Uh, they generate n vertices. And then for every pair of, of, of vertices, they flip a coin. If it comes down heads, they put the edge in. If it comes down tails, they leave it out. So they have a random way of generating a graph. Now, their coin isn't a, a, an unbiased coin. It may only come down heads one out of a thousand times or something, so you'll have a relatively sparse graph. Okay, and what they could do is if you look at the vertex degree distribution in these graphs, you can prove that they're tightly concentrated about some expected value. This comes about due to the law of large numbers, which is something that is important to understand and to be taught in, in courses. Uh, the difficulty with this theory is somebody went out and looked at a real-world graph. And this is the United Airlines route graph for North America. And you'll notice that big cities have a high degree, and there's a bunch of cities with low degree, and this degree distribution is anything but concentrated about its expected value. Okay. So people change the definition. Um, and uh, what they did is they started to grow graphs. They started with one vertex, and at each unit of time, they added another vertex and some edges. And if you do this and put the edges in with a property called preferential attachment, in other words, the probability of connecting to a high degree vertex is much higher than, than a low degree one, uh, you get a power law distribution of degrees, and this matches what happens in the real world. Uh, I'll show you something else about graphs. Uh, and this is an exercise when I teach an undergraduate course. I always ask students to go out and find a database that they can convert to an undirected graph and then find the connected components of that graph 
and count how many components of each size. So this was a database on proteins and what I discovered is there were 48 isolated proteins. Oh, there's an ed uh, so the vertices of the graph are proteins and there's an edge between two vertices if the proteins interact. Uh, there are 48 isolated ones. There's 179 pairs of proteins which just interact with each other and so on up and I looked up at, there's actually 16 proteins which interact with one another and then I didn't find anything up to a thousand. Now the important thing to do is when you write a computer program is make sure it's right. So I added up the number of vertices in each component and I came up with 899 proteins. But I started with 1,851. And where are the missing proteins? Was there an error in my program? Well, what I did is I ran the program a little further and lo and behold, I discovered this giant component of 1,851 proteins. And you might say, wow, that's strange. Until you do this exercise, pick any database you want out there and do this exercise and you'll find out the graph has a giant component. And that says there's something fundamental about giant components and we better understand why every graph has one. Okay, so I've talked about a science base and what, what do I mean by a science base? And I'm uh, quickly going to go through and talk about high dimensions and show you what a science base in high dimensions looks like. If you put points down at random in two dimensions and you calculate the distance between every pair of points, what you will discover is the maximum distance is much, much larger than the smallest distance. Okay, this looks like it's about five times bigger. Uh, what would happen if you repeated this experiment in high dimensions? And high only has to be about 10, but I did it maybe in 100. Uh, it turns out that all distances between pairs of points put down randomly are the same, essentially the same. And the reason for that comes about by this law of large numbers. If you calculate the distance between two random points, x and y, what you do is you take each coordinate, take the difference, and square it. So the coordinates are random, so x sub i minus y sub i squared is a random number, and you're summing a large number of random numbers. And as long as uh, the probability distribution of these random numbers uh, has a finite variance, the law of large numbers says the answer you get is going to be tightly concentrated about the expected value. Okay. Now, this says something. If you're going to deal with high dimensional data and you're going to cluster the data and all pairs of points are roughly equidistance, I wonder if my algorithm is going to be stable. I wonder if I'm going to get the right answer. So we better, better look at that. Let me show you something else about high dimensions. Suppose you take a unit square. So it's one unit on each side. So it has one square unit of area. And then you look at a unit cube and look at the, the cube in higher and higher dimensions. Its volume is always going to be one. But what would happen if you took a unit radius sphere and started raising the dimension? It turns out if you write the integral and go through the arithmetic, you'll find out that the volume of the sphere goes to zero. Kind of surprising. I would have told you it was some constant probably and wondered what it was, but it, it's, well, it is a constant, it's just zero. Um, so let me show you the consequence of that. Uh, suppose you have a Gaussian distribution and uh, if it's one dimensional, all, all of the probability mass is within three standard deviations of the, the center. Okay? And all my Gaussians are going to be centered at the origin. But what would happen if I looked at a Gaussian in high dimensions? So it goes off this way in every dimension. And I ask you, how much probability mass is there within a, a unit radius sphere centered at the origin? Well, if you write the integral and integrate, you're going to get the answer zero because there's no volume in that sphere. So it turns out though, even though the probability density is maximum at the origin, there's no probability mass close to the origin. Interesting. Well, it turns out that to find probability mass, you've got to increase the radius of that sphere until the radius gets big enough that the sphere has non-zero volume. And that turns out at square root of the dimension. And if you go out a little further, since the probability distribution is dropping off exponentially fast, 
all of the probability mass is going to be in a narrow annulus centered at the origin. And uh, you can make use of this. Uh, suppose you had two Gaussians and you were getting data from these two, but you didn't know which, which one, uh, for an individual piece of data, which one it came from. Could you figure it out? Well, notice that these annuli just barely overlap. So that if you gave me a data point, I ought to be able to figure out where it came from. So I generated, uh, was it 500 points by, from two different Gaussians. I colored some red from one Gaussian, blue from the other. If you look at these and you see the way they overlap, you'd say, how are you going to tell me if you hadn't colored them, which Gaussian produced which point? In other words, if I gave you that data and asked, where did, where did it come from? And it turns out it's very simple to answer. I can reliably tell you where every one of those points came from. Uh, the way I would do it is uh, I know the, the points from a Gaussian are on a thin annulus of radius square root d, and I'm going to just approximate that by a sphere. And I know that if two points come from the same Gaussian, they will be square root 2d distance apart. How did I know that? Well, I generated the first random point, and then what I did is I rotated my coordinate system and put that point up at the North Pole. Then I generated the second random point. And I'll claim that that second random point is going to lie on the equator. How did I know that? Well, if you look at the surface area of a sphere in high dimensions, all of the surface area is at the equator. And therefore, the point's got to be at the equator. And therefore, I know that these two vectors are 90 degrees apart. And I could, and they're of length square root d, so the hypotenuse of that triangle is square root 2d. And that's, that was the answer. Now, you might be a little bit bothered. Because you say, I arbitrarily put the North Pole up at the top, which arbitrarily fixed an equator. What if I'd put the North Pole somewhere else and the equator had been somewhere else? How can you claim that every point is going to lie on both of these equators when they're not the same? Turns out, if you think about it for a while, it's, it's true. Uh, the, the point that I want to make is that high dimension, our intuition was formed in two and three dimensions. And when you start dealing with high dimensional data, you better upgrade your intuition or you're likely to be in a little bit of trouble. Uh, the, so the expected distance between points, if they're separate on two different Gaussians, uh, you can go through uh, the arithmetic and you'll find out that their uh, distance square root of delta squared plus 2d, where delta is the distance between the centers of the Gaussians. Uh, by, the, by the way, I'd like to leave the slides, if that's possible, afterwards with, with someone. So if anyone wants to go and pull this up and check out the arithmetic themselves, they, they can do it. So all I need is that the Gaussians are far enough apart so that the square root of delta squared plus 2d is greater than the square root of 2d plus some gamma. That gamma is due to the approximations that I made uh, uh, to get this. And it turns out, as long as the distance is, is greater than the, I think, the fourth root of d, uh, you can do it. But you can do much better than this. Uh, there's something called dimension reduction. Uh, if you have a number of points in a high dimensional space, and all you're interested in is the relative distances between pairs of points, what you can do is you can project those points down to a lower dimensional space, and the relative distances will all be preserved. And that says that rather than dealing with data which is 10,000 dimensions or a million dimensions, why not project it down to 100 dimensions where your program will be much faster and, and things may be a little bit more stable. So what would happen in the case of these two Gaussians, suppose I could draw a line through the centers of the two Gaussians. And then I projected all of the data onto that line. Notice that the centers, since they're already on the line, stay the same distance apart. But the data points get closer together. They get closer to their centers. And also notice that the perpendicular distance from that line is all Gaussian noise. So what I'm doing is I'm throwing away the noise, and I'm increasing the signal-to-noise ratio. And it turns out if you do this, the Gaussians only have to be separated by a small constant, independent of the dimension. Uh, just for time, uh, so 
what I would like to, to do is, is point out that uh, I showed you what a, a science space in high dimension might look like. And you're at a key point in computer science. Uh, those of you that are starting a career, if, if you recognize that there's this fundamental change going on, and you start to create this database for the future, rather than trying to epsilon extend the database of the past, your career is going to be fundamentally different. That's what I hope that you'll walk away with. So what other areas do we need to develop a science base for? Uh, it turns out there are things like ranking. Uh, ranking is very important. You rank restaurants, movies, books, web pages. Uh, some of the faculty in here rank students. I suspect the students maybe rank faculty. Uh, it turns out that ranking is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, if you own a company and you want your web page to come up at the top of Google's list, there are other companies will tell you what you need to do to your web page to get Google's search engine to think it's the answer it should give. And Google, of course, is spending a lot of money trying to prevent people from doing this. And what we would really like to have is we'd like to have a way of ranking which cannot be manipulated. But at least uh, a, a way of ranking which if someone manipulates it, you could detect that it was manipulated. Uh, in other words, if, if somebody uh, raises their website by a method called spam where they put a lot of links to it, uh, you would like to know that those links aren't just there for natural purposes. Some would put them artificial and just not rank that web page at all. I mean, for, I'm sure that some of you here, if you're in a sports club or something like that, have been approached by various people who say, you know, we really like to encourage sports at universities, particularly uh, the kind of stuff you're doing, and we're happy to give you uh, a grant of a few hundred dollars to, so you can buy equipment or something like that. And it would be nice if in exchange for that you'd put a link from your web page to our web page. Okay, uh, what they're doing is for $200, they're buying a little bit of spam because your web page is important and the fact that it links to theirs raises their page rank and moves them up on the list. So uh, this, this is really a big industry. Uh, another is, is collaborative filtering. Uh, you may wonder how Amazon, when you buy one item, how they can give you a list of things that you might think were important. Uh, based on a single purchase. And it turns out there's a mathematical theory that tells you how, how to do this. Uh, it involves factoring a matrix and using the information of all customers to, to fill in one portion of the factor and then uh, only trying to figure out certain properties of you for the other and then multiplying these together. Uh, there's dimension reduction. We talked about that. Uh, extracting information from large data sources. Uh, that's sort of like this, this hummingbird example where we, we found the flight paths of hummingbirds. Uh, you're gonna, that's something that you're, you are going to do and it involves understanding Markov processes and things, things of this type and that has to be developed. Uh, social networks, uh, there's a whole host of things. And uh, what I'd like you to walk away with uh, is that the information age is a, is, is a fundamental revolution that's taking place. It's changing all aspects of our lives. I don't want to claim it's the only uh, thing that's driving things. There's similar revolutions going on in biology and in, in other areas. Uh, but those individuals who recognize that the future is going to be fundamentally different and position it for themselves uh, are going to benefit enormously. And uh, the conclusions are that uh, we're in an exciting time of change. Uh, information technology is a big driver of that change. Computer science theory needs to be developed to support the, the, uh, this information age, and computer science faculty need to update what they're, they're teaching for, for the future.